Why can't a woman living in Europe be buried in Canada? Because she lives in Europe. You don't bury a living person. What? Gents, welcome back to a new episode. I am Rudy Samuel, and today I'm chilling with sisters Sophie and Louise. We're going to talk about the NPC, non-profit company, their journey, being Congolese in South African, and how they've succeeded in what they've done. So, ladies and gentlemen, Sophie and Louise. Thank you, ladies, for coming on to my channel. Thank, thank, you, thank you for having us. us. Thank you so much. Can you guys just tell us about yourselves, what you guys do, and we'll take it from there. Okay, so my name is Sophie Kanza. I am from the DRC. I'm 27 years old, and I am a peace activist and um, an international speaker and I'm also an international relations student and you are? Mm. my name is Luis Kanza uh, I'm almost 26 years old <laughs> I'm uh, from the Democratic Republic of Congo as well co-founder of the Sophie A. Kanza Foundation that has been that Sophie and I started in 2014 and uh, yeah, that's you me. Are a graduate? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. I'm an international <laughs> relations graduate currently doing my honors in international politics. All right. And cool. you're gonna skip past that. <laughs> Imagine no, that's, humble that's, or what? That's, <laughs> that's not even how it is. Yeah, yeah. So your foundation, I'm gonna go straight into it. The Sophie A. Kanza Foundation. What is it about and how can anybody get involved? Because I've seen what you guys have done on social media and I must say, you know, it was really fascinating, hence why I, Ask you guys to come through. So, what are some of the things you guys do? So, in a nutshell, I would say we are a focus on youth volunteerism, uh, good deeds, peace advocacy, and um, Afrophobia awareness. I think those would be our pillars. And then um, the umbrella is basically getting um, youth involved in. Uh, social cohesion in uh, volunteering and involved in their communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we live in South Africa and we know that um, there's a bit of an issue about like xenophobia, Afrophobia and all of that kind of stuff. How do you guys combat that? And what's your message? Because I personally don't understand why you should hate your fellow African brother or sister. So can you guys like shed some light? Well, it's a very sensitive and complicated uh, topic to discuss. But basically, um, we would our main thing was to have a conversation about something that not many people were familiar with, a platform for people to have a platform to discuss. Because like us and you and a lot of other Congolese youth were brought here in the early 90s. Yeah. So we're like the first generation of young adults to live out. Most of our parents um, grew up in Congo yeah. or elsewhere, and they have that culture that we don't have. Uh -huh, and we, yeah. have to, we have now the responsibility to create something new yeah. in, in South Africa as um, this first generation. And we've had many struggles that, you know, if there was a platform like this earlier on, for, other, for, for us when we were growing up, maybe we'd feel we'd have a sense of belonging because that's the main thing. So initially, we just wanted a voice for us because um, we felt like we were always too Congolese to be South African and then too South, South African, African to, to be, be Congolese. Congolese. That's my struggle. So yeah, many of us have that struggle and it's so insignificant because no one before us had it, but no, they don't, like our parents don't really realize that we have that struggle because uh -huh. we came here young yeah. and it's very, it's, it's, it's a culture shock as much as a lot of us didn't grow up in Congo or some of us have never been to Congo, we were born here, but you still have that culture shock yeah. because there's the language barriers, cultural differences and all that, you know. So you find yourself trying to trying to assimilate trying to, but at the same time staying true to who you are and it's very difficult mm -hmm. it's very difficult to do that you yeah. know you want to as much as possible fit in here but at the same time you don't want to you don't want to you don't want to become someone else you don't want to become one you of, lose yourself yeah you don't want to lose yourself you you know you go home and your parents 
speak to you in a different language, the culture, the food that you eat, everything yeah, is yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. But when you go out, you go to school, you go out with your friends, and you exposed to a different sort of culture. Yeah, 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 so just yeah. trying to get all of that in the mix, it's it's it's, it's quite difficult. It's quite challenging. I mean, it is fun and rewarding at the same time, but yeah. overall, it's not an easy task. Mm-hmm. And uh, exactly, how do you combat xenophobia when it comes to the South Africans in the equation, and not necessarily us who go through this daily struggle of being too South African mm. for the Congolese and too Congolese for the South African? Well, we really try and get them involved. Uh, we find that a lot of times Afrophobia is inherited or it's uh, built on a foundation of stereotypes. And a lot of people hate us, but they don't know us. Yeah. They hate us, but they've never spent time with us. Yeah. And that's why we have a huge focus on youth volunteerism Mm -hmm. because we're able to go out into communities together as youth, as diverse youth. Um, Largely, it's South African and Congolese, but uh, um, we we really try and get people from other um, African countries to to get involved. Um, So that would be one. Um, Number two would be we have two forms that we... um, Louise has directed and that we put out there that are um, we try to we try and put a human aspect to yeah. refugees, asylum seekers and migrants because uh, a lot of time people don't view us as human if they viewed us as humans they wouldn't burn us to death yeah. they wouldn't burn our houses chase us away from school uh, you know so we try and appeal to people's humanity um, through, through the, the phone because we really wanted a platform that was intergenerational, yeah. um, that could be shared easily, you know, how things spread on WhatsApp and things like that. So that would be true. hear you they want to know um wh- what drives you um a lot of time people ask us like why do you do this yeah why? yeah and um it's sad that you, you you need a reason to help people yeah but um we we share our story um all over the country mm-hmm. all over the world and uh really try and get people to to, to see the human aspect because um as we said, we're young adults now, but most of the trauma and the discrimination that we went through, we went through as children. Um, and I think the biggest thing for us is that we don't want uh, migrants, asylum seekers, or refugee children to go through what we went mm-hmm. through. Uh, luckily for us, we turned out, um, I'd say, we pretty turned fine. Out good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's other kids that, you know, the, this, this trauma could be make or break for them. Yeah. And then the fourth thing that we do is to um, call organizations to talk mm. and to tackle institutionalized Afrophobia. Uh, you know, Louise mentioned the personal experiences, and then, you know, I've mentioned the experiences with um, South Africans or other Afrophobes. And then uh, one that's not mentioned as often is institutionalized Afrophobia and, you know, burdens and hurdles that keep us from advancing. Yeah. And talking about um, everything you've just said, I remember on social media, it was very publicized. There was a big altercation between you and a certain bank, a well-known bank. How, what happened and how did that problem get resolved? So... Because <laughs> it, was, it was big. Yeah, it was big. <laughs> I had a, a full-on tour. Um, Twitter war for those who don't know. <laughs> yes, a Twitter war with uh, the Red Bank. And I think the reason why it was very important for us to do that was because there, there's, there's a lot of misinformation in the air about migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, immigrants, etc. That we have access to certain things that we do not have access to. And um, you know, that's what per- per- perpetuates stereotypes like stealing jobs yeah. and um, People think refugees get grants and things that are, are just not true. Uh, for example, the the job 
thing really like gets to me because we aren't even able to open bank accounts if you are a refugee or an asylum seeker so if you don't have a bank account in the 20th century it's tough 21st 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 century like how how are you supposed to work especially in a in a country that's as modernized as south africa yeah. you know in places like kenya the drc where we're from you know people still get paid cash or you know like uh m pesa is you know is taking over so in south africa without a bank account it's, it's tough so that's how we fall into um exploitation because the people can pay you cash and it does it, there's no tax to it etc but anyway um yeah so the the bank was rebranded themselves as pan-african and yeah and first thing that came to me was like as usual pan-africanism is being used to to target rich africans when pan-africanism shoots targets the Africans. poorest of yeah. the poor and all Africans. Mm -hmm. So I asked them, but how can you brand yourself as Pan African when you don't allow asylum seekers or refugees to open bank accounts? Mm -hmm. And um, as Twitter would have it, so many refugees and asylum seekers who are my age or younger jumped on it and they were like, actually, I went to a branch mm -hmm. and I wasn't able to. Yeah. And you know, so many people started sharing their stories. And um, I, I took it upon myself to call myself and my team to call 10 different branches from all over the country. Mm -hmm. Cause now the bank was totally denying yeah. that they, they you know, their exclusion policy. And I think in the migrant community, it's a well-known fact that mm -hmm. you can't open a bank account at you know the major banks. And uh, so then I, I um, collected all the phone calls, the numbers, the branches, and put it on the thread, and they just continued denying this. And more people started sharing their stories of how they were turned away, etc. And um, yeah, so it just people took screenshots and put it on groups, and I was yeah. getting messages of people who were sharing their stories, mm -hmm. etc. And I think it was it was a turning point for a lot of us. Who don't believe that we have rights mm -hmm. and that who a lot of us who believe that we can't speak out um, on injustices that we suffer especially from um, big corporations mm -hmm. like that um, and through the altercation they were called on to a television show on ETV yeah. that was um, presented by a very good friend of ours um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then she was able to speak to what is his position? I think he's the spokesperson for the bank. Yeah, yeah, he's a spokesperson for the bank, and he was well, he wasn't able to explain why they do that. Um, and the, he didn't really get answers because he, like a lot of people, he didn't really know Understand, the yeah. difference between the different documentation, etc. But I just feel that, um, it was really a right uh, a step in the right yeah, direction definitely, yeah. um and we we still carrying on with the tour <coughs> because we haven't got to fight the battle man yeah we haven't had any um any success yet mm -hmm. but um we're not going to give up um at least now they know who we are and yeah. they know that we're not afraid of them yeah yeah and what are some of the challenges you guys go through and uh, you know having a non-profit company and how do you guys overcome these challenges Wow, there are so many challenges, but um, the biggest one I would say is that <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> we can't help everyone, True. and that's the biggest challenge that we have, because we initially started as just the volunteering part, and even that was they had a lot of challenges because we'd get approached by so many causes. Can you guys help us with? You know, and it, yeah. it obviously costs a lot of money and a lot of time because, as we mentioned in the beginning, we have, you know, other parts of our lives, not just the NPC. So I would say the biggest challenge that we face is not being able to help everyone. And also trying to help, same thing, trying to make a name for ourselves here and help the Congolese community here and still trying to do that back home as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's that's a very 
big challenge. We have a lot of goals. We have a lot of dreams. We want to. We want to reach a lot of people, yeah, but yeah. it's very, um, it's very challenging. It's very difficult to do that. And obviously, we're never going to be able to reach everyone. Yeah, but you know, we think about that. So how how big is the team, and how can one person get involved? In growing the teams so what happens is all our events are on our Facebook page and our Instagram we invite everyone so everyone is allowed to come to our events and then when we have certain people who come to more than one event or you come to a few events mm. then you'll end up finding yourself on the whatsapp group you'll all end up right. having a hoodie and a yeah. t-shirt everyone is welcome it's that type all of right, cool, yeah cool. so we're a big family um, we yeah we deal with I think on the WhatsApp group now there's about uh, 25 of us. Oh, interesting. And yeah. yeah, we just try amongst ourselves and then the te- when you become a part of the team then you like um based on your job or your friends you try to organize them. Yeah. So we don't have we don't even have to organize everything. People will be like, you know, my church group wants to do something and then you guys jump or on. my colleagues want to do something and then we just, you know, that's that's the that's the type of culture we're trying to create because not don't don't always wait for like us to come up with something but now it's it's really nice that um our team members also make the effort yeah 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 and uh i saw you went to holland for an award or something like that what was that about and how did you end up winning that if you did win <laughs> okay so for um holland i went to one young world which is a summit that they host annually and their um aim is to have a representative from every country in the world um, and for the past six years, Congo has been one of the most underrepresented countries, which is completely wild <laughs> because <laughs> we are a huge nation. Yeah. Um, so I was chosen to represent my country, which was, you know, um, an, an extreme honor. Um, not only because I haven't lived there, but, you know, I haven't been there in such a long time. But um, it was just very special to me because I'm, um, you know, uh, I, I'm never there, but I'm always rapping. Yeah, of course. So it was great for me to uh, represent my country, to be to hold my flag and walk across the stage. And um, again, we were underrepresented because I was the only Congolese person there. But um, it was really amazing to be there. And um, yeah, I hope to see more Congolese people there this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. And what are your guys' future plans individually and as a group at the foundation and stuff? Where to from, from now? Um, so, uh, obviously, we have a lot of plans that, um, firstly, we want to stay consistent because that's very important to us. So the, the different projects that we have, we're trying to do that. And um, so the film that we made, the first one that... Or the first two that we made were very successful so we really and we've had people reaching out to us and they want to to do something you know longer because uh, the films that we had are very short so they want us to they want to collaborate with us to to make more films to raise awareness because that was one of the films or one of the most successful um, parts of our activism so we really want to do that and we want to get just more um, advocating for policies to change and calling out um, just so that people can be really aware of the yeah. real situation because there are so many misconceptions mm-hmm. there are so many misconceptions of, about the situation I mean you know you live in Johannesburg um, the issue with xenophobia afrophobia African immigrants is Johannesburg is basically an immigrant city and it's not slowing down yeah. so there will always be there'll always be something for us to speak about or an avenue for us to to explore yeah. that's for the the organization, yes, for the organization. Person. personally what's your plans um so as i mentioned previously i'm doing my honors and depending on how hard it hits me i will see if i'm interested in doing masters yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to to. Um, I've always been serious about school. Uh, so I wanna I wanna see how far school Eagle. can take me. Yeah. yeah. And what about you, big sis? Well, I'm trying to get this degree. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, starting a family, definitely on my list, and trying to see how I'm going to juggle 
family life and activism because I, I, I travel a lot and uh, you know being in tours can be dangerous <laughs> so yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing how, um, how, how how that will plan out and yeah especially I think uh, we, we go, we're probably going to go into a space where we're going to move out of on the ground work yeah. and more into policy work yeah. uh, because the on the ground work is great but if you're not changing people and then the generation's the lives then um, it, it, it's I don't say it's insig- insignificant but you know uh, rather rather we teach people how to fish than give them fish yeah yeah so we really want to go into policy change you know take these things into parliament because it's it's ridiculous it's real now yeah, yeah. There's, there's people 25 that were born here and have nothing to show for it yeah they can't go to university they don't have a document that even allows them to leave the country yeah. um and those are things that we want to change and then um one of our biggest dreams is to build a cultural hub in Kinshasa. so that's our long-term goal and yeah, right. carry on sharing our story and um, encouraging others to share their story as well. Very important for us because we know we're not the only ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming on to the channel. Thank you guys for watching. I wish you guys all the best with all your, your projects, your plans, and I really wish you guys can succeed and change the lives because it's the human thing to do. You know, we gotta love, we gotta share, we gotta be kind. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it. Shout out to Leonie at the back of the camera. And stay tuned for the next episode. I'm really Samuel, and I'm signing out. Thank you. Where is an ocean with no water? No way. On the map. And lastly, oh my gosh. which room <laughs> okay. has no walls? A greenhouse. A mushroom. <laughs>